Welcome to Engineering Innovations, the official podcast of the Purdue University Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I'm your host, Kristen Malavenda, Communications Director for Purdue ECE. Join us each month as we delve into the cutting edge advancements, transformative research, and insightful conversations shaping the future of this field. Our guest for this episode is Zubin Jacob, Elmore Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Zubin, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you, Kristen. Thanks for having me. So let's start at the beginning and how you ended up an engineer. You know, how far back do you remember being interested in things that led you to engineering? Sure. So I'd say I was always interested in physics, and I'd say different aspects of physics, um, thermodynamics, mechanics, electricity, magnetism. And I'd say that it naturally led me to want to think about radiation at a very young age, optics, things you can see, mm -hmm. um, and how does the eye work, and many things related to radiation in general. And um, it so happened that um, electrical engineering was the discipline that was connected broadly to electricity, magnetism, radiation. It had some amount of physics in it, but it also had a very applied aspect that would connect it to the real world. And that's why I naturally gravitated towards electrical and computer engineering, and I've kind of had a happy home there for a long time. Is your anybody in your family, your parents, were they engineers? You know, my dad is actually a, a metallurgy engineer. So okay. he does deal with um, some aspects of metallurgy, uh, high temperature metals um, melting, and uh, different aspects of actually related to making um, castings for... Um, automobile parts. So oh. I'd say there's a bit of a, a mix between metallurgy and mechanical engineering. So growing up, that was normal in my house to right. be talking a lot about uh, water pump housing, uh, intake manifolds, and stuff like that. Yeah. So it was natural for me to start thinking about um, engineering and um, maybe kind of physics and material science at a very young age. So talk about your research and kind of how it's developed over the years, where your interest started and where it's led to. Sure. So I'd say I started, um, as I mentioned, I mean, pretty much in high school thinking about optics. So it was very natural for me to start doing some research in optics as an undergraduate. Yep. I was very happy to be able to do that. But I was doing some experimental work on lasers. And that was really kind of interdisciplinary because it was some amount of chemistry, some physics and electrical engineering. And then for my PhD, I gravitated towards doing some more theory work. Okay. And um, that was because I was not sure exactly um, what I'm good at and what would I like to do. Mm -hmm. um, I enjoyed optics, so I knew that was the broad area I want to be in, but I was not sure about what are the things that I really um, am good at. And it turns out that I was... Um, reasonably good at doing theory and I, I migrated towards doing some theoretical design of yeah. optics devices imaging during my PhD time and then I've moved on to various aspects of imaging but because of my interest in physics uh, I have also kind of continued my interest about really tiny um, light matter interaction phenomena um, related like atoms and how mm -hmm. light interacts with them and what can we do at those very tiny scales that can lead to next generation devices. And um, HADAR is one of your research projects that got a lot of attention. It was featured on the front cover of the journal Nature. Talk about that and kind of what it meant for you to get that recognition. Great. Right, thank you for asking about that. So we've been kind of lucky that this has been all over the place and uh, um, we've um, enjoyed the attention that this brings, but we've also stayed focused on what we really want this HADAR to be in the future. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, okay. how the research came about. So HADAR stands for Heat Assisted Detection and Ranging. And uh, this is a machine perception approach. So think about it as a way of perceiving your surroundings, but something that you can do in pitch darkness. And the reason you can do it is because all of us, all the objects here, the microphone, our body, everything is giving off radiation, yep. which is heat radiation. And it turns out that this is something you can't see with your eyes, but there are thermal cameras which can see it. 
Okay. So what we were able to do is um, show that um, this heat-assisted detection range ring can see through pitch darkness like in the daytime. Yeah. And uh, this is something because it caught the imagination of a lot of um, people. It has it, it just received a lot of attention and we've been really happy about it. And uh, our next goal is really how do we do the engineering needed to bring it to the people. And then what will it be used for and what applications so, you know, one of, one of the first things we are thinking about is autonomous navigation mm -hmm. um, and just um, advanced driver assistance systems in the nighttime. Um, the pedestrian accidents are really large, specifically in the nighttime. So any sort of driver assistance systems that work in the night um, is very important. So using the heat radiation, we can actually really develop some of the next generation systems and also autonomous navigation in the nighttime. Uh, this is a, a major... Uh, area of interest but you know going down the line we really think there are biomedical applications of this oh. and uh, there's definitely applications in other spaces that we want to explore but exciting yes every every direction talk about um any interdisciplinary work you have done i know that's important these days bringing in people from different areas who are you most likely to work with in terms of what other fields and how is import how important is it to have that Actually, I, I, I couldn't um, stress the importance of interdisciplinary research more. And, you know, the best thing about being uh, electrical and computer engineering is, you know, we have uh, possibly the most breadth in terms of uh, the type of research that we do just within EC. Right. And the ability to communicate uh, with various departments on campus and anywhere, national labs, Department of Defense labs, uh, just the ability to really interface. Yeah. And having said that, for this HADAR research, what was interesting is that we had to learn a lot about um, AI, what is computer mm. vision. So it turns out that the uh, natural extension was talking to computer scientists. And they have a very specific way of looking at images, image processing, uh, vision problems, uh, machine learning. And we had to make that bridge. And that was very rewarding. And uh, I'd say that was the first one, but along the way, we've also worked with physicists and chemists and material scientists on different problems. Great. Um, what challenges, just not particularly for HADAR, but any of your research, what kind of challenges have you encountered and what do you do when you encounter a challenge to kind of get past that roadblock? All right. So, you know, these challenges are really part of every day. And these challenges could be in many different ways. You know, sometimes it's a scientific challenge. Uh, Sometimes it's um, a, a technological challenge that, you know, you just your detectors don't work fast enough. And uh, sometimes it's a funding challenge. Mm -hmm. You don't have all the ideas. You have the people, but, you know, you just need that dollar amount to execute. Right. And sometimes it could just be kind of interpersonal relationships, right? When you're working with people, uh, there's always challenges of what direction you might want to go in, what direction, uh, say, your team might decide to go in or your collaborators or funding agencies. So, so these challenges are very, very, um, I mean, possibly almost on a daily basis. And I think I have found a, um, a lot of um, various approaches to um, deal with them or like uh, internalize the challenge and then slowly get to the answer. So I'd say the first one is sometimes defining the problem and defining the challenge very clearly. Yeah allows you to see through what is important and what is not. So just spending time, sometimes alone, sometimes on a walk, Happy Hollow Park, <laughs> right? Yep. And just uh, taking the time to analyze the problem and uh, just see what's going on. That clarity just allows you to make these tough decisions as they come along. And then also just getting time to uh, distract yourself from, from the challenges sometimes allows you to come back with fresh set of eyes mm. To see what's going on when sometimes when you're really deeply involved in the challenge um everything just seems like a challenge and then you just get overwhelmed yeah so I, I found a couple of ways to be able to disconnect and then come back what would you say to i notice particularly in our undergrads they get very anxious and worried about what they perceive as failures what would your advice be to them as how to approach that sure you know i was listening to uh, some 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 podcast and I did hear uh, one of the kind of famous engineers talk about you know failure after a certain point becomes a core competence you really want to be able to know how to fail and um, 
just get up and go about your day right. about the challenge to really make a difference um so failures are really the essential part of being successful and um sometimes you know being able to fail um fast is helpful in mm-hmm. some ways you know not overthinking and over analyzing and really just taking the risk doing it and learn from the failures and move to the next step yeah i think i think that's a really nice way of doing it sometimes learning from other people's failures right if there's sometimes is knowledge really is something that can be assimilated in a very um non-linear fashion mm-hmm. and, and and very sometimes almost a chaotic fashion how knowledge is um you are assimilating knowledge right. as you are working in the field and um i'd say that uh, just being talking to a lot of people and learning from their successes and failures and avoiding some pitfalls is very helpful and and just having some mentors and coaches yeah to really um teach you things very quickly than having to fail many many times right yeah. so how does your research fit into your teaching you know i i teach a a, a bunch of courses i i'll tell you about the undergraduate course mm-hmm. i teach i teach uh, what is known as signals and systems and that's really just telling you um what are signals in general optical signals uh, heat signals uh, and uh, acoustic signals mm-hmm. sound um as well as electrical signals like how do you analyze them how do you decompose them how do you find hidden information in signals that's what the course is and the way the research kind of um plays in over here is that we are constantly trying to get maximal information from the signals that we receive mm-hmm. and this could be sometimes very weak faint signals right so think about it if you're in a dark room and you want to just um find some object there so that's really a signal processing problem there's very few few photons entering your eye and your mind has mm-hmm. to decide where is the object so there's a lot of connection between the research we do which is on the frontier and what is the language that is used to execute that research gotcha and that language is what we teach in the undergraduate courses so i'm not going to ask how long ago you were an undergrad but certainly things are different for today's undergrads than they were for you what's the difference between when you went through engineering program and the students that are at ECE today you know um i think that the 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 good things are that the ECE engineer today knows a lot more about ECE and the world than uh, say what people in uh, my generation or earlier would have really understood about ECE right uh, just because of how much knowledge is available uh, on the internet um how many different approaches there are to learning and uh, just having a, a lot more um diverse set of influences uh, in the life of an engineer right so i'd say those are the positives uh but i'd say there's also some challenges because there's a lot of information out there and it is possible to start thinking about uh, information as knowledge and there's a lot of distilling process needed between a lot of information and the fundamental principles underlying that information and that's what we teach and yeah. so the electrical engineer today because of the amount of information that is available to an undergrad as they are um kind of learning yeah it may cause them to be confused sometimes easily or may mislead them in ways um and sometimes you know just the distilling knowledge is requires a lot of hard work mm-hmm. and um it may seem that that hard work is not as important as just collecting information from different sources right so those are how do you do the balancing act that's mm-hmm. really the challenge you mentioned uh mentoring a little earlier how important were mentors to you and how do you view your responsibility now to mentor for ECE students great no absolutely so i think i would not be uh, a the the engineer i am today if it was not for my mentors so that goes all the way from my undergraduate mentors from whom i learned to the phd mm-hmm. um supervisors to even today um even as a faculty member you often reach out sometimes just to colleagues as well as senior faculty mm-hmm. for um advice and you have to take decisions that just seem very uh complex and they just able to distill the 
information very well. So mentorship is really one of the most important things that I recommend to everybody at all stages. It's not that you're an undergrad and you need a mentor. I get it. You need a mentor at every stage mm -hmm. of your career and uh, you pretty much need actually a circle of mentors to really be able to um, navigate through the complex um, professional career that we all have. And um, so I have received a lot of mentorship and now it's definitely, uh, now that I'm in a position where we I understand a lot of things and challenges that people go through at various stages, I've made an effort, effort to uh, be available for the undergraduate students. Mentoring them sometimes is something as simple as what university they should apply yeah. to after they are undergraduate. Sometimes they're wondering, should I do a master's or should I do a PhD? Or should I just go into industry and make money? Right. So there are all of these type of challenges that um, undergraduates often face. And then, of course, I spend a lot of time mentoring my graduate students as well. And that's really most of the time I spend to the senior graduate students mm -hmm. who are going to go out into the world um, and how do they navigate their research careers. Why did you choose academia over industry? What was the draw? You know, I'd say the draw was being able to, I'd say, execute a vision that you have mm -hmm. and also being able to uh, work at a pace on the details um, at a pace that you would want as yeah. opposed to, say, the market forces or um, other um, kind of important considerations. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that was my uh, natural reason to gravitate towards academia. And of course, I, I enjoy the research process and publications. Yep. So when I was graduating, there were not so many industries. Um, there was a time when industries used to do a lot of research, then it decreased, and now it has gone up again. So I did graduate at the time where the amount of research happening in industry had decreased. Yeah. Um, what do you think makes Purdue ECE special or distinct from other ECE programs in the country? All right, very good question. So um, obviously I'm biased. <laughs> and I think that uh, we are uh, among the best, if not the best, uh, EC departments in the world. And I'd say that it's really the the breadth of efforts that are allowed to blossom uh, in the EC department. That's the first thing that comes to my mind, that we, we are welcoming to um, applied mathematicians, material scientists, chemists, physicists, who all come and uh, contribute to ECE in some unique way. Like we have faculty from different backgrounds and uh, they they are very valuable in even in training the next generation of ECE engineers because ECE is just the broad discipline that allows you to propel yourself in any career in any direction mm -hmm. going ahead. It could be energy, could be machine learning. Right. It could it be um, medicine. Right. So all of those things, it's a really strong foundation to have as a, um, and having people from different backgrounds just allows really wonderful um, ideas and intellectual ventures to blossom. So I'd say EC department from a research point of view really is, is very unique. The other thing is what is the amount of um, effort, energy and care that we put into training our undergraduates mm -hmm. and graduates? So I'd say that a lot of decisions that faculty take and so forth is often in the interest and um, well, taking into the well-being of our students. Right. And I think that putting students first also makes us a very unique uh, department. Yeah, I would agree with that too. Um, is there anything on the horizon for electrical and computer engineering that you're particularly excited about, trends that are coming up or new technologies? Sure. I think we, we are all excited about the possibilities of, um, I'd say, generative AI mm -hmm. and how it interfaces with uh, different kind of traditional disciplines in ECE, um, including like vision um, or I would say image processing, mm -hmm. as well as uh, sensors, new sensors that star are very adaptive and um, energy efficient, as well as um, information hungry in some sense mm -hmm. that, that really start thinking about what data to collect uh, as it is out in the field. And I'd say that's something that is very unique. It's um, would not have been possible, say, 10 years back. Right. And I think that's one thing I'm very excited about. 
I'd say the other thing I'm excited about is also the on the quantum side of things, mm -hmm. how our understanding, uh, which is now very mature in terms of um, how do you control um, various quantum aspects of devices yep. and how do you actually come to um, bring all of that into fruition for societal impact. So I'd say those two things are of a lot of uh, interest to me and, and many of my colleagues. Um, a lot of people are scared of AI. And people say that it's going to you know, take over the world and take over jobs. What do you say to people who are frightened about the impact of AI? Sure. You know, I think it's um, always good to be um, careful and cautious when new technologies uh, are adopted so that we do the right thing in why we adopt these technologies very widely. Um, having said that, it's also important to remember that some of this um, uh, fear mongering is also kind of media related mm -hmm. and um, blown a little bit out of proportion. Um, the like AI doesn't have any intent to take over the world uh, any more than let's say a very good toaster has. I <laughs> I heard that in, in another podcast, and so I'm just going to you know, paraphrase that. Yeah, and so it's it's pretty much like that. So unless it is really programmed to do something right, by, uh, people. Uh, it does not have an intent of its own to take over something. Right. And I'd say that um, being mindful and aware of that uh, is uh, very useful and maybe having the that uh, filter while reading media, uh, sensational media stuff yeah. is very useful. So here at Purdue, our engineering students go through first year engineering and then they decide where they want to specialize. What would you say the biggest misconceptions are about electrical and computer engineering that would like maybe prevent a student from thinking that was for them? Right. So I'd say the first misconception is that it's too difficult mm -hmm. and it's not for me. And I'd say that uh, that's um, incorrect. If you're using a cell phone, mm -hmm. if you're using a, co using a computer, if you are, uh, you have some solar powered gadgets that you've kind of interacted with, which all of us have, right? Yep. So that's pretty much what you are trying to understand and learn in a methodical fashion. And considering that you do, all of us interact with um, these type of technologies today, uh, it makes, I would not say that this is uh, too difficult um, for most engineers or anybody who has kind of an interest in engineering. Right. Um, I'd say that that's the first misconception. It's too difficult or it's not for me. Mm -hmm. I'd say the other misconception, which I think we should clear up, is that, you know, ECE is not fun. Right. Or ECE engineers are not fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just that we enjoy a different type of fun. And it's something, uh, it just takes some time to see from outside that right. oh, you know, these guys are having a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, it, it, doing many different things. Right, so I'd say that the misconception that uh, ECE is not fun or electrical engineers and electrical and computer engineers are not fun. Yeah, I'd say that's another big misconception. Yeah, yeah, you're fun. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I would also yeah. say I hear from a lot of students like they don't understand that if if you like um, com computing and things that any industry needs electrical and computer engineers. So, you know, you could go, come here and then literally go do anything that you want to do with it. And I don't think people really understand that. That's precisely the most important point that ECE gives you a foundation to choose a career path in along many different directions. And I think that um, that foundation is extremely valuable throughout your career. And I think that's probably why I, I would rate ECE, of course I'm biased, mm -hmm. as the best discipline uh, to actually train yourself as an undergraduate. Gotcha. So sometimes you're not teaching classes or in the lab or doing things on campus. What do you like to do when you're not working? Great. So uh, I like to take some breaks um, with, in the bubble tea places on oh, campus. Oh, yeah. Right. There, there are quite a few of them have sprung up and they're pretty good. <laughs> so I, I like to maybe take some time off, relax over there. And uh, I also listen to music. I've been listening to that for many years. So just um, finding new music and listening to it. So I've always been doing that and I enjoy that. That's very, um, helps me unwind. And I'd say that um, 
sometimes movies a little bit of mixed martial arts watching oh. yeah watching uh, some mixed martial arts but that's about it yeah is there a pr- certain type of music that you gravitate towards or you just pretty much listen to anything i think i listen to um uh, mostly i mean everything i'd say a uh, little bit of singer songwriter you know, mm-hmm. maybe um I-, i enjoy that um and um uh I used to listen to uh some blues and jazz before mm-hmm. so um definitely um these are the uh, things that I naturally kind of run right. towards right yeah well thank you so much for joining me today Zubin thank you so much Kristen for having me and thank you for tuning in to Engineering Innovations the podcast where we explore the forefront of electrical and computer engineering be sure to subscribe for future episodes and leave a review to help us make the podcast even better Until next time stay connected with the Purdue University Elmore Family School of Electrical and Computer Computer Engineering on our website or on our social media. You can check the show notes for that information. And thanks so much for just taking the time to listen. We'll have another episode next month.